afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our ADSET webinar. Firstly, I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, that I am on Aboriginal land, um, Lutrawitta, and I'd like to acknowledge and pay um, deep respects to the traditional owners of the land, the Palawa people. Uh, I want to pay um, res my respects to the uh, elders past and present and emerging, and I'd also like to acknowledge the Tasmanian Aboriginal community who continue to main their identity, maintain their identity, culture and Aboriginal rights. Um, I'm Darlene McLennan and I'm the manager of the Australian Disability Clearinghouse in Education and Training. And this month at ADSET, uh, we're celebrating Dyslexic Month, Dyslexia Month. Uh, so we've done a number of things. So for those who haven't been on our website of late, um, um, I've, um, yeah, sorry, I've just been interrupted by uh, something else here. Um, uh, we've actually changed the font onto on dyslexia, which is the dyslexic font. So for those who haven't had a chance to get onto our website, have a jump on and have a look. You can turn that font off, um, but yeah, we've got it all month um, as it is. We've also had Trevor Allen, uh, an esteemed colleague of ours, uh, promote um, or actually review our content, which is called Opening All Options, which provides um, people, teachers, students, etc., with information um, around um, everything around learning disabilities and the further education sector, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, and so he's doing some reviews on each of those areas. So they're articles that currently sit on ADSET. Next week, we have another webinar, which is around supporting students with dyslexia in um, university. Uh, and that's going to be um, given by Christina Smolder from CQU, who has done some research in this area. And today, our webinar is around hearing from the students around their experience um, with, with learning dis having a learning disability and study. So we're very fortunate to have students from the university sector and the TAFE sector. Before I introduce the students, I just wanted to talk about some housekeeping. If you are needing to use the closed captions, you can click on the button, the CC button in the toolbar that is located either at the top or the bottom of your screen. You can increase those numbers of lines um, appearing on the caption box by clicking the small arrow in the top right hand corner. If you have any technical difficulties, you can email us at admin at adset.edu Au. I'm going to host this, facilitate this panel with the students, asking them some questions. Thank you to everybody who's um, sent in questions um, prior to this. It's been amazing how many questions we've received. We're probably not going to get to them all. Um, but we also want to encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar. So you can do that by going into the Q&A box, the questions and answer box. So, um, and we've got um, David Swain, a National Disability Coordination Officer, moderating those questions. So he will um, shoot them to me to ask at the end, end of my um, panel facilitation. If you'd like to have some conversations with yourselves um, and chat and ask each other questions, please do that in the chat box. Um, you just need to mark um, that to be all, to all participants, um, and that then gets conversation happening alongside. Um, so sometimes that's great if you've got a question of, oh, you know, what did the student just say about that? Um, can you provide me with the, the name of the technology they discussed? And somebody will, you know, be able to put that up in the chat box. So it's a great way, I think, to also keep um, being engaged. So that's it for the, <clears throat> the housekeeping. So now we're over to our fantastic students and that's what the webinar is all about. So today we have um, Megan from Mount Q um, Gravatt, that's how I say it. So Megan, if you want to give us a wave. <laughs> Thank you. I've got James from Mount Gravatt with Megan. We've got Judzira. Jud Jud I'm, Jud Jud I'm already saying that wrong. Sorry, Judzira. Um, who is from Deakin. Maddie from CQU, based in Sydney. <laughs> and then Paul from Swinburne in Victoria. So thank you all for joining us. It's absolutely fantastic to have you here. Um, it's been a really great, I think Jane's had conversations, our, um, our project worker at ADSET with all students and has come away with such a positive feeling um, and, and um, enjoyed the engagement with the students. <laughs> so I'm sure everybody today will um, also get a lot out. So first we just wanted to hear um, a little bit about yourselves um, and, um, and what you're studying and so forth. So we might start with you, Maddie, and we'll go through the, each of you. 
Okay, um, so I'm at Central Queensland University, um, the Sydney campus. I'm studying a Bachelor of Podiatry Practice Honours. Um, I'm just finishing up my second year um, and I've had dyslexia since I'm about eight years old. Um, I didn't finish high school and I got into the via a program called SIX that they offer students. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Now, um, yeah, so I might go over to you, Megan. All right. Well, hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Megan, and um, I'm currently studying at Mount Gravatt TAFE. I'm doing a Certificate 3 in Education Support. Uh, I graduated from Faith Lutheran College in the Redlands, but as you can tell, I'm originally from the UK. Uh, about my dyslexia, I wasn't diagnosed until I came to Australia. My family and I were not aware that I had dyslexia, but I received a, a great uh, education at Faith Lutheran College, and they helped me with my education support, and now I'm moving on to becoming a teacher aide myself. Brilliant. And James? Yes, hello. I'm, my name is James. I'm, I'm currently studying a a diploma in fashion design and merchandising here at TAFE Mount Gravatt. I, I wasn't actually diagnosed with dyslexia until I was 16. I, I'm 19 at the moment. And um, uh, I was originally, I was diagnosed with Asperger's when I was in grade one. And my, throughout my whole education, it was always assumed that my lack of learning progress was due to my Asperger's. And it wasn't until we actually um, heard about dyslexia that we started to look into it and get myself um, uh, uh, what's the term just um, recognized as dyslexic. Fantastic thank you James. And Jazira? Hi so my name is Jazira I'm currently studying a Bachelor of Science I've just finished my first year and I was not diagnosed with dyslexia until I was 18 and, and doing advanced literature. So. Wow. <laughs> Excellent. And Paul. Hi. Um, so uh, I was diagnosed with dyslexia when I was in like uh, grade two. So I was eight ish. And um, I didn't finish high school. I went, um, I got, um, I went to TAFE. I did my cert four. Um, then I got into my bachelor of computer science through that. Um, and I'm in my, and I'm in my final semester in the last two weeks of uni, hopefully. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing your time with us and to all of you, but being your last few weeks, it's, I can imagine it's quite stressful. So thanks. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. They're great stories. So um, we're just going to go into some questions that um, the, the students have all received. And what we're going to do is um, I'll ask, um, try and give everybody equal airtime, but also um, students will jump in if there's a burning question that they want to answer. So, I think because major a lot of the audience today will be um, education providers, but also disability practitioners that you will have come across within um, your education um, sector. But this kind of question is, how can education providers improve your experience and access to education? So what kind of things can universities and TAFEs do um, that will have an impact on, on your, um, your lives and your study? So Maddie, did you want to go first on that one? Uh, well, I think it's to do with, um, it's, I think it's like, um, trying to find, uh, it's a lot to do with technology nowadays. And, uh, I feel like technology is a big thing. I know personally, I was more of a auto person learner than a textbook learner. And, uh, there was a lot of, uh, special education support, computer systems and apps and, uh, that helped me with my studies and I feel like universities and schools especially need to have more of those things. Um, I think that's one of the best uh, things that schools can do to improve on the education support system. Uh, when I first started out um, doing the trials for finding out my dyslexia, um, I was at like the very beginning. Uh, the special education support nowadays is a lot better. When I was in school it was just starting out so um, there has been a, a change over the years and, um, but yeah, that's my opinion. Anybody else want to have a go at that question as well? Yeah, 
I think communication is always key to most things when it comes to studying in general. And I find having my lecturers aware of my dyslexia and where that may affect me helps us have better communication and much faster communication. For example, I really struggle with reading and interpreting data in graphs. So if my lecturers are aware of that and they know they're going to be focusing on a graph for an upcoming lecture, they can preemptively send me an email to warn me or to ask if I need further explanation. That way I'm not constantly trying to keep up with each of my individual lecturers on the things that I found difficult. If they're aware of it, sometimes they can help me keep up as well as me sending them emails. Yep. Um, the thing that has, because I'm doing computer science, there aren't a lot of written assessments, but whenever we do have a written assessment, um, it usually ends up being in a exam. So um, Swinburne has a really good um, accessibility lia lia liaison people. Um, and um, I, get, um, I get 20 extra minutes or so for every hour um, of writing time um, in, in an exam, which is really useful for just spell checking everything, um, et cetera. Um, plus um, I also have um, dysgraphia, so I can't really handwrite. So for a lot of math subjects, that's really hard because of um, getting the specific symbols on word is much slower. So I also need extra writing time for that stuff. Um, and yeah, so you need extra writing time. But um, Jadzia's point about just communicating with your teachers about what your needs are and asking for help because of if you lose track in a lecture, it's vital that lecturers and teachers um, have um, have um, consultation time to help students outside of class. This applies to everyone, not just dyslexic people. Yep. Excellent. Manny, did you want to add something to that? Um, well, I pretty much agree with what everyone said so far. Um, I'm offered a scribe and a, um, a reader for all of my exams, along with extra time. Um, in addition to that, I also have software such as like ReaderWrite Gold that um, support me um, with like lecture content or reading things out. Um, and communication is absolutely key. And having a lecture that's open to understanding your disability um, really helps with your learning process if they can make adjustments if required. But if they're closed-minded and they they don't understand, it makes the learning process really difficult. Okay, excellent. I was having a little bit of. I was getting a bit of feedback from your sound, Maddie. I don't know if it's just through the other mics or something. I'm just. I've just text Jane to see if there's a solution. So hopefully she'll solve it. Um, James, was there anything you wanted to add? Because it was probably a question, a, a question for all of us. I'll give you an opportunity to answer it as well. Um, oh, sorry, could you just um, repeat the question? So it was around what can education um, provide? What can the universities or TAFE, what can TAFE do to support you um, around, you know, your um, um, support you in, with dyslexia or your learning disability? Well, the thing about my personal experience with um, my coping with my diff my disability is that I wasn't diagnosed with dyslexia until after I left school. So um, I was, there was no real effort to help me um, to push for more, uh, for push for special education in a, towards dyslexia, so to speak. So, um, uh, but to, I guess in my, ex to answer the question, I would say that it's just um, uh, a more more recognition, I'd say that um, if with school administrations, because you know um, it might answer, I might use the same answer later, but some of the schools I I did go to because I moved around a bit. I, um, one school had a fantastic disabilities and learning impairment. Um, sector and others were just sort of, you know, we were given an old building and just, so I, I guess just to say that, you know, if schools and education providers, as you said, would understand that, understand them, um, uh, uh, sorry. Yep, no, that's fine. If they can um, uh, understand the 
um, process of, you know, on the learning challenges that these kids face, they can better, you know, administrate those particular sections to best to keep in the best in the students best interests. Yep. Brilliant. Excellent. So um, you've all spoken about the impact of, you know, having those adjustments put in place. Um, so that's majority, I presume, would be through a learning access plan that's gone to your teaching staff. Is that the, the case for all of you? Yep. 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 Okay. And how do you feel that access plan works? So do you feel empowered by that? Um, is that something that... Um, yeah, it was different than your when you're at school. You you may not not probably have been in charge. You know, probably have a lot of say over the adjustments that you put in place. So hopefully, as students, you've had some input into that learning access plan. So how has it benefited you having a, an access plan within your your university or TAFE? Dramatically, I yeah. came from a high school in which I was diagnosed. <coughs> within my last year of high school. And after that diagnosis, I had to go through the process to try and get any form of assistance from that point onwards. And I was denied that assistance. So I was not given extra time or any form of assistance for my year 12 exams. So to go from being told I was not dyslexic enough to have assistance, to get the assistance that my speech pathologist and specialist have told me I would benefit from is extremely empowering because I felt like I could do my best to my best capability and was no longer feeling like I was being held back and to have that communication and to be able to change it as I learn more about coping with dyslexia has been really important and empowering. Anybody else want to add anything to that? If it wasn't for my access plan, I would have had to, I wouldn't, I would have left, I would have had to leave uni in the first semester. I've, yeah, so same thing with Jazz here again. Like high school, just nothing. Primary school, nothing. My mum would have to go to school every day and fight, to, fight tooth and nail. Like one teacher wouldn't let me use a piece of paper to cover up the other lines on the book to help me read it. Like, it's insane, like how militant they are about, no, 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 you have to do, like, I can, it's not fair unless you make these adjustments, that is fair. But at university, I have the access plan that I can fall back onto. I think it also helps that you have one department which handles all of the, um, all, all of the exams every semester. And um, you also have it, and you also have the same, um, Accessibility liaison, and I have had to make changes to my accessibility plan um, to add software, and that process has always been really easy. Um, it's never caused me any stress, which is really good because of um, you're busy enough with your other uni classes. Yep. So, yeah, that's brilliant. Okay, um, so then you just raised um, some inf um, technology in that pool. So we've had a little brief discussion previously before we started about technology and the impact on on that for your study so what kind of technology have you know each of you used that's actually helped you in your studies i personally love okay. read and write gold sorry yep that's okay we'll, um, we'll go to you next. Yep, go for I, I started using it at the beginning of uni and i'm still getting used to using it i think it takes me a lot of time to learn how to use technology i don't really like technology, but I know that it's very efficient. And the thing that I've been using most has been using anything that can work for reading textbooks out loud to me. Having all my textbooks provided to me digitally so that I can listen to them whilst I'm reading them has really helped me maintain focus when studying alone. Being able to have both happening at the same time, both reading and hearing is personally far more effective than just reading my textbook. I don't think I would have absorbed any of that information if I was only provided the textbook to read physically. And Maddie, you uh... Yeah, I um, I also get provided um, my textbooks on like online digitally. Um, I remember my first term of university, I was studying in, in psychology and I had after textbook and it was huge and 
I just couldn't follow any of the information. I had no idea what was going on. Yet alone knowing how to pronounce half the words in that unit was a struggle. So definitely having software that can read out, um, read out to you, like read about gold. I think also I've just recently discovered that um, Microsoft Word is like you can read can read stuff out to you as well. So those two programs really help. Brilliant. Yeah, no, we actually had a webinar um, with Microsoft a couple of weeks ago and just, you know, they certainly are um, moving forward in this area, which is absolutely brilliant. So for you, James, what technology, we talked a little bit prior to this of some of the technology and tricks you use? Um, uh, it's uh, just having a bit of a think over at my head is that um, with my fashion course, obviously it's a very hands-on practical course with, you know, not a lot of reading and writing and such on that. There is some, but um, I, I, I spoke earlier about some apps that I have on my phone, one of them being um, uh, Gingerly. Uh, no, it's Ginger Page, my bad. Yeah, and Ginger Page, which helps me, which can help um, basically write out a sentence and it automatically corrects your sentence or shows you correct spelling or different types of words <clears throat> you need to write. But um, um, I don't use them that often, especially not in my course a lot. And I, and even during my primary school days, I didn't have, well, we don't, we definitely thought about, you know, programs like laptop you know, speech to text to help me um, write out assignments, but we never really did it. So I'm not really, um, I'm not very familiar with using or used to using these types of applications, but um, I could, you know, I think my reading, my uh, yeah, reading and writing could definitely improve 20, uh, uh, 90% improved <laughs> by using these apps, but yeah. Yeah, that's something to look forward to 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 learn about. So, Megan, what what kind of technology or apps or, or things do you use? So, um, I got to use a wide range of different technology stuff when I was in high school. Um, instead of going to learn different languages, I would go to extra English and math class. I learned on this program on a computer how to to do do the typewriting because normally I started off just doing two fingers and then I certainly moved into the whole piano thing um, and uh, one of the students said before about uh, using auto for reading uh, using auto books when I was reading novels in English or science was probably one of the best tools that I used a lot of the other students also they didn't really understand and I think students not just teachers need to be educated more in what dyslexic students actually need to use to help their studies because a lot of students kept saying oh Megan's not learning properly she's actually cheating she's she doesn't have to read the book but I am actually reading the book I'm just listening to someone reading it to me while I look at the words and travel along that is how I would regain the knowledge from a book or a novel. If I try to read it myself, I physically can't hear the words in my head, so I'll just forget about the page. And after reading a whole book on my own, if someone asked me, so what was that book about? I would say, no clue, because none of the information would have come to me. Um, when I go to TAFE, this is probably my third TAFE course I'm doing. And throughout my different TAFE courses, um, I've been having extra time with exams and assessments, I was able to get a reader to read me questions and exams, and yes, I was given extra time. Uh, currently now, while I'm writing my assessments for my Certificate 3 in Education Sport, I've used a link called Studiosity. It's a place where you can upload your assessments. A teacher runs through the assessment for you and writes you feedback. It's not just feedback about what you've written about, it's also how you've written it, your grammar, your text, the information, what you've gotten from, and I found it very helpful. It sort of like remind me of back in school where I would give a draft to my teacher, they give me feedback, and then we give in the final production of it later on. But yes, it's been a really good useful tool for me. Excellent. 
<coughs> now, Jadzira, you said you use reed and write. Is there anything else that you use in your everyday or that is? Only just the digital readers that Internet Explorer has because you can just use that reader and I find that has a slightly nicer accent than read and write gold but no I'm still so new to understanding dyslexia and what is available I don't really know what's available so I've only sort of used what has been made blatantly obvious to me yeah and Paul for you um so yeah because my course like all the software I use is specialized to make programs so the only like dyslexic tools I can really use as a spell checker, which will just tell me if it's spelt wrong, which is really useful because if I wrote like, I wrote like a 5,000 line program. And then I realized that one of the core parts of it that I had used everywhere was misspelt and I couldn't fix it because it would be too much of a nightmare to update everywhere. So um, then I, um, so then I just installed that plugin, but the Google of just copy and pasting a word into Google um, and uh Obviously, you can't do that in exams, which means at the end of the exam, I just have a list of words, which I have no, no, me and word have no idea how to spell. Um, so then I just, um, so then I will just ask um, the exam person, because actually is a part of my accessibility plan that they can help me with spelling words in exams. Um, and that's really useful as well, because I wouldn't pass probably any units because I can't spell mm. words. <laughs> Uh, dear. So I often lead from your your um, thing there, Paul, you always seem to say something which I'll lead into the next question, it is about assessments. So when thinking about the assessments that you undertake for your study, what kind of assessments work best for you? Um, so I, I, you may not have had any opportunity to, you know, your uni or TAFE might, this is the only way, but sometimes there is a bit of flexibility around assessments. So what, yeah, what works best? Uh, it's yeah. Maddie, you, oh, Maddie, you want to go first and I'm coming to you, Paul? <laughs> we need an order. <laughs> um, at CQU, we do quite a bit of variety of ways they assess students. However, if they um, is like the predominant way that they will assess a student, um, some units like my advanced anatomy and biomechanics unit right now is really good uh, because they do a, we have a quiz. Um, and in that quiz, obviously, I'm, I've got a, a scribe at extra time, um, but we also had practical assessments as well, which are very hands-on. And I guess it sort of depends on what um, the degree or program that you're doing will depend if you have sort of hands-on unit, uh, hands-on examinations and stuff. But I definitely prefer quizzes and like practical hands-on assessments as opposed to essays because they take me hours to write and I'll be up till two o'clock in the morning typing away. <laughs> Takes a long time, yeah. Okay. And Paul, would you? Yeah, so um, I love project-based units where you'll have a big, where instead of having a final exam, um, it's a series of projects, but that obviously can't be applied to every subject. It's a lot harder to do that for like math subjects. Um, yeah, but project units just, um, I feel like I'm demonstrating what I know a lot better because it's not relying on me feeling, um, it's not relying on me feeling like good on that one exam morning. Um, it also helps a lot with not getting anxious because you kind you know what grade you're going to get before the end of the unit um, because it's, you're building up towards it as opposed to, oh, I forgot, oh, I slept like, I slept really badly the night before. So I guess I'll just lose a lot of marks in this, in this unit. That's some sound difficulty there. I don't know if someone tapped. Uh, it's gone now, so that was a bit of a worry. <laughs> <laughs> Woke us all up. <laughs> so, Zira, did you have anything to add to that one? Yeah, I, you, I just do the assessments I have to do, but there are, of course, assessments I prefer and I find... For example, I'm doing a science degree, so I have a lot of lab work to do, and we do have to fill out little lab papers, but usually, particularly when you're filling it out in lab, you have someone there who you can discuss with, and they're the person that marks that paper. So even if what you've written down doesn't fully 
articulate how well you did in that practical session because that person has had a conversation with you they can understand how well you understood that concept and I find that in those I can always do really rather well because I can communicate the ideas when I know them a lot better verbally than I do written so I sort of use them as an opportunity to make up for the marks I'm going to lose eventually in longer written assignments as I know I'm always going to lose say two or three marks for the spelling and grammar section and you sort of just have to reach a point of acceptance when it comes to those sorts of things and try and work your way around it I find. All right so what about um, teaching staff like the, the you know the academics and teachers how is there any kind of things that they can do or you know their approaches towards supporting you um has worked well for you while you're studying so <clears throat> yeah so uh, james mate. yep I might. uh oh i've only been at tafe since july of this year so most of my knowledge comes from my high school years and i hope that's Yep, Open. that's great. Yep, fine. Um, I, um, the way I best, I found best helped me learn was, you know, um, if I actually had a teacher's aide or someone actually next to me to help me understand, you know, if I'm, if we're all um, calling back to one, some English classes I used to have, you know, if we were all reading a book and we were, uh, Miss was pointing out certain sections for us to focus on, and if I had a question, you know, I, you know, I would feel more comfortable, you know, just asking, you know, asking, hey, um, what does this mean? While, you know, Miss focuses on, um, talking to the class instead of actually putting my hand up because, um, I was always very self-conscious about putting my hand up and halting the whole class just to answer my little question. And, uh, you know, just having, you know, if, it, uh, if, uh, if you are looking for ways to help a student who is struggling, um, a good, definitely good place to start is, you know, talking to them about would a actual teacher's aide in the, in the class with you to help you talk, help you um, process the lesson would be a good, um, would be a good thing to uh, start with, I would say. Yep. Excellent. Yeah, was, oh, we are um sorry because <laughs> we are we are normal students we really are and I've heard a lot of people say like dyslexic students are different they can't function information as well as normal students that is to me absolutely not true and teachers and teacher aides um, the special support that we give us like we can take in knowledge and information and advice just like any other student it just takes us a little longer in in our minds to process it and then we do get it in the end and teachers and teacher aides I have seen some teachers that are not all like that they expect us to be just like any other normal student to follow along read the question once we would understand it but we don't we need that extra push forward to try and get to our outcome goal and um, luckily the teachers for me at my school were very understanding. And I had, when I was in the UK, I actually missed out a lot on school early in my life because I had leukemia. So during my cancer treatment, I missed out a lot on school. But luckily the teachers for me at my school, uh, they would save me notes and tell me, right, you can even do some work at home to catch up but I was in chemotherapy for probably two years in my early development of learning. So even if I didn't have my cancer, I still feel like I would have had maybe some dyslexia abilities because I think it was somewhere in my family line too. Um, but that definitely affected, yeah. And it was so early that I had my cancer, then I got left behind from learning just normal like everybody else. Um, but yeah, the teachers were very understanding. It's more to do with the students because I get teachers um, they want to help you and stuff but then when it comes to the students I think they need to be educated as well on what we have to go through that's different to what they have to go through and even 
you will not find a school anywhere now that doesn't have people with dyslexia or disabled learning or anything like that. Every school is now different and the education industry is it's expanding and changing so much. And that's the good thing. And education will definitely get better now that we have all these different systems and changes to help us with our learning. Mm-hmm. So Megan, you, know, you talk about that experience with the students within schools. Now you're in an adult learning environment at the TAFE. Do you feel students are a lot more um, accepting of diversity or difference within the classrooms? And- oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm surrounded by loads of people that are just like me that have difficult reading or writing. We relate more and it's easier to work together. Um, and definitely at this TAFE college, in our presentations, in our workshops, what the teacher's doing is she is basically using uh, PowerPoint presentations and speaking communication out in public to explain the class instead of if you go to university if you go to lectures um the teacher normally uh because i i did uh, go to a lecture once at queensland university for my sister i just joined her that day i saw the teacher at the front with the computer just going through loads of slides and i just saw loads of university students looking at the slides and writing it down and that wouldn't work for me because i wouldn't know what we were talking about I wouldn't be fast enough to read what's on the the PowerPoint and I would miss a lot of information what my teacher Nikki does is she goes through the slides she narrows down the topics we have group discussions we have group activities um, and it's a great way for us to learn the new topics yeah brilliant Jadira have you had a teacher or an academic that um, has kind of had an impact on you in a positive way yeah i have had a teacher she has a hearing disability so i think that gives her the advantage of understanding what it's like to have a bit of a disability and a disadvantage and she took the time to clearly she thoroughly read through my access plan and she knew where my weaknesses lied and that was mostly due to dyscalculia so that's math-based dyslexia so when i'm presented with a graph on a powerpoint If the teacher's going through it and saying this line means this and that and such, I'm not going to gain any information from it being explained to me like that. And I know most students will. So she took the time to pre-warn me before that lecture that we were going through a graph and sit down with me and go through that graph in person, one-on-one, slowly and in really great detail so that when I went to that lecture I could sit in that lecture and take notes without having to try and understand the information for the first time and that meant that I felt like I was on equal pace because I can keep up in a regular lecture as long as there aren't graphs and my physics teacher unfortunately that was a online subject which I found really didn't work for me and would never ever do again particularly for a math based subject but I did have limited but some opportunities where I could sit down and go through graphs and diagrams with the lecture and just being able to sit down and go through with someone who in depthly understands the subject, not just a math tutor who just understands the math, but someone who could also understand the physics was a really great way. But the most important thing teachers do is feedback. It's nothing worse than spending a really, really long time writing out an essay and getting your feedback and your feedback being like, you need to edit more. You've made spelling mistakes. Because you know you've made spelling mistakes. That's something that is unlikely to change mark-wise in your future. So it's really important that teachers are aware of which papers they're grading are from dyslexic students so they know to give feedback that's actually relevant to us pointing out spelling mistakes is still useful but it can't be the only feedback we need to know what else we did wrong so we can work on things we can actually change in those papers right and paul did you have you had any impactful um teaching stuff for yourself part of my accessibility plan that i can't be marked down for spelling mistakes so that obviously has helped me a lot, but um, yeah, for teaching staff, one-on-one consultation time, it always trumps like watching a recorded lecture again because of it's, um, because of the recording for lectures rarely ever actually work correctly. Um, they're often 
if they write on the right if they write on the whiteboard or something, it's useless. Um, the microphone won't be working. So consultation time with the teacher one on one. Um, I also um, I am also a teacher. I teach a subject at my uni, um, intro to programming, and I've only gotten one accessibility plan, and I've been teaching for four semesters. So there's obviously like there's probably at least been four dyslexic people in my classes um, and I just haven't been informed, but I try to do the things that um, I know help me, which is just not standing at the front, not standing at the front of the class talking for the whole time because that's what le lectures are for. It's vital that you have that, that you have time to go around and ask students because I know personally, and it's it's I'm a massive hip, hypocrite for hypocrite for for it, but I hate asking questions in front of the whole class, even though I encourage it when I'm teaching, just because of it's kind of I know it's I know it's silly, but it's still a bit like when you're dyslexic, you always you always have the mis you're always afraid of the misconception that you're stupid, right? Because it happens so much in primary school and very regular school that. Sometimes I get over it, sometimes I don't, but that's why it's important that I just have a chance to just ask the teacher alone a question. And I know that's why I try to not talk a lot when I'm teaching, well, not talking a very long stretch because yeah. it's really hard to get over that hump, especially for an intro class in your first year. No, and that's a great practice because, yeah, I mean, the classroom will be full of diversity, you know, students with different makeups. And I think, yeah, if you can vary your teaching, um, which is fantastic. Maddie, has there been any impactful teachers for you or what they've done? Um, yeah, I was taking a pharmacology unit last term and I was struggling so, so much. And I honestly thought I might've hit the dropout, but this, I contacted the lecturer. Um, I contacted the lecturer and um, he got back to me pretty much straight away. And he called me and we had a discussion about how we could break down um, the pharmacology unit to make it more manageable because we were presented with uh, sometimes like 180 lecture slides per week on a subject and I did, and on top of taking the full load I became overwhelmed and having that communication with the lecturer approached me um, we discussed the plan um, it was really crucial, like actually passing that unit um, also as I progressed into the degree um, more productive focused units um, and finding that my lectures are really good with my disability plan um, and yeah there are things in, yeah just as the degree gets um, as I progress throughout the degree um, my disability plan I think is understood a little bit better. That's good so what what do you um, wish that your lecturers or educators you know the ones that probably aren't haven't been so good what do you wish they knew about dyslexia or learning disabilities would there be anything Maddie that you think you would like them to know or understand better? Um, I guess I, that I'm not different to everyone else and um, I am like intelligent and I do understand concepts, um, but just because I don't necessarily know how to spell or write very clearly doesn't mean that like I'm not, not intelligent and I think um, just yeah, I feel like sometimes I have to prove myself at university, which shouldn't be the um, yeah. yeah. James, for you, what what's one thing that you would like your teachers to know about your learning disability or you know of learning disabilities generally? Um, uh, I'm not sure if this applies to everyone else, but to me personally, is know that um, uh, just something as simple as I mentioned before, just putting your hand up and asking questions was quite difficult. And Paul um, mentioned that before that, you know, you don't want to be a class idiot, a class dunce, but it's, um, uh, you know, that uh, it's, you know, that sometimes, you know, if we look like we're not, like something's not clicking in our head and, you know, we haven't put our hand up, had a hand up, it would be worthwhile, you know, just to, you know, walk around the class asking, okay, do you know this? Do you know that? And um, if they, and that would give students the opportunity. Well, uh, actually, um, I'm unsure about this. C could you help? And um, 
uh, it's and also um, building I mean I know um, teachers go through students uh, like hundreds of students every year learning hundreds of new faces every time and it's impossible to keep track but um building a rapport with a student that you know is having trouble so that they're more open open about asking questions to you and they feel more confident you know as, you know confiding in you about what you're having trouble with and from there you can build you know you can build a you know a plan or you know a system in which um, you know the student can learn from you know the student can learn and uh, but go, going back to my previous yeah it's just you know uh, if well, well no that I mean that, what you've said is absolutely brilliant and I think that yeah, kind of developing a relationship with the student, you know, and that, that confidence for you to come forward is really important too, to have that. So, Megan or Jadzia or Paul, anything you wanted to add to that at all? Or, yep, Jadzia, yep. Yeah, I think also teachers need to be, I suppose, careful about how they phrase feedback to students. I think sometimes there can be a misconception, particularly when students otherwise do well, that some of the things come across as laziness on our part. And I experience that quite frequently in that I might ask a series of questions and it seems like I haven't made the effort to go out and find other resources to teach it to myself or I haven't bothered to edit. And I think being aware that it's not laziness, it's I can't, you know, just use a Khan Academy video to teach myself this math formula. I'm going to need someone to sit down and explain it to me. And that's not laziness. That's just not how my brain works. And I just feel like that's an important clarification. That I do edit my work and I am not lazy. I'm dyslexic. <laughs> it's a good point. It's so frustrating when you hear that stuff, isn't it? <clears throat> uh, I Right in the, uh, I've been looking at the comment section and we've been getting loads of different questions. Uh, there's one, uh, does a student need to have an actual diagnosis from a professional to be able to get an access plan? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, well, normally the process is for the, the universities and TAFEs is you do have to have some formal documentation to actually receive um, receive the adjustments in the um, in the university or TAFE. And that's often a challenge because often students, people aren't actually diagnosed in schools and that's often where you actually get access to psychologists that can do those um, assessments. So then when students come into university or TAFE, um, you don't, and you'll normally have to have an assessment probably from the age of 16 and above because, you know, the brains do change and, and universities and TAFEs require that assessment after that age. And sometimes, you know, you may have been 14 when you got your, your assessment. So, and it becomes quite expensive, but yeah, to actually get the adjustments for, for learning disabilities, you do actually need to have a formal diagnosis and assessment. So, yeah. yeah. You, can also, you can also get updates on your assessment. <laughs> I probably had my assessment done for my dyslexia when I was probably 10 or 11. And I actually looked at my report the other day, everything from reading to writing was on the below average scale, but you can get them updated. And my uh, teachers told me, hey, if you get another assessment done nowadays, your level from where it was to where it is now has improved so much. And that was a very important thing for me to know I can now write assessments, I can now read better, I can now uh, remember words better and it's just been such a help with the teachers and especially my education's definitely improved at TAFE as well because they offer those extreme um, support things that nowadays schools are trying to follow. Yeah. And universities are doing the exact same thing too, but yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. Now, just another, so we have gone on to the questions from the the audience. I probably didn't mark that um, that in the kind of the, the format here. So one of the um, other questions that somebody from the audience asked was around the experience you have when you're actually enrolling or, you know, so the kind of the global um, uh, the global um, systems, you know, that you use within universities and TAFEs to apply, to then, um, you know, to choose your subjects, to, to, you know, the emails you get from the universities or TAFEs. How, what's been the implications for you having, having a learning disability with 
how much, especially in the university se sector, I probably can't comment as much as TAFE, of how much they bombard you with written words and questions and stuff in their systems. Yeah, so, that, that happens a lot. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, I, I wasn't going to university anyway. I was just focusing on graduating from school and continuing with TAFE. But um, I would say the workload and the written assessments that we get, um, they are similar to university ones. It's not like I've, I've heard that some people think that TAFE is just like, oh, if you can't, if you're not good enough to go to university, then TAFE's the second option. And um, I've definitely seen loads of people talk about it as it's where different students go and like it's not actual work. It is actual work. We're doing assessments and work experience just like anybody else would do at university. This is just a different way of getting qualifications and the workload is just as significant as uni work is. Mm, no, it definitely is. It was more about the, I suppose, the system. So, Jadzira, when you were trying to apply for university or, or if you studied at TAFE as well, the application processes or enrolling, how has that been in, in regards to having, you know, um, your dyslexia? And so to be forth. frank, it was madness. Yep. I found it extremely frustrating and confusing. I find it confusing to just re-enroll for the next trimester to try and keep track of what subjects I do need to do, what subjects I can avoid, how many subjects I need to do. I'm only doing three subjects I rather than a full plate as I tried that and that really didn't work for me. Um, and I found the only way I could wrap my head around the mass of information that I was in flux with was to physically go in in person and talk to someone. I find that's kind of how it works. In most situations with my dyslexia, I just end up having to suck it up and talk to someone, even though that's very <laughs> frightening to do. And open days were how I got my information, talking to other students. I couldn't remember for the life of me what my advertising emails were telling me, but I could remember which students could actually answer the questions about what systems do you have in place for dyslexia and which uni said, I don't really think we have much in place for dyslexia. And I think talking to uh, course advisors at high school or even going into the uni you're applying for and sitting down with a course counsellor was how I keep track of things because all of those emails, especially when you're trying to pick uni is just, it's just overwhelming. Are your microphones muted? <laughs> Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Me and my coughing, I've wanted to not cough and my colleague in the room next door just yelled out too. So, um, so Paul, um, yeah, any experiences for you? Uh, yeah, the enrolment, all of the universities and enrollment systems and stuff, it's so distributed. I honest, it's hard for me to tell if they're just bad. I think they're just bad. I don't think it's, I think it's much harder because of my dyslexia. Um, I do go to, um, yeah, I, they're because they they're distributed across everything. And as a software person, I understand why because you just kind of buy them and then you tape them together. But it is hard and it's really important to encourage students to go to student HQ or whatever it's called at the uni and just talk to someone because like I've had people which enrollment mess ups is super common. It's hard to find a uni student which actually finishes on time, quote unquote, because of there's a lot of unintentional enrollment mistakes and stuff and intent. Yeah. So just they're really hard to use and it's important to tell people where to actually get the help with fixing it because of like Swinburn has something called Ask George and Swinburne's great. Let me make that clear. But Ask George is useless <laughs> online. Like I think it probably harms more than it helps because if it makes you think you can get an answer, but then it doesn't really. Yeah. So the people face to face or but talking to a person yeah. is probably what's yeah. assisted you. And Maddie, have you any experiences with, you know, enrolling and applying, yeah. et cetera, that um, my enrollment process, to be honest with you, is pretty, pretty smooth because I went through a, the pathways program at the university. Um, yeah, I think the use of the enrollment process for me wasn't too bad. Um, where I got unstuck was how to enrol into my units and 
and actually following that process to make sure that I could get you in the Yeah. Yep. So that people think. All right, well, we've only got five minutes to go. So I suppose I just wanted to, to give you all an opportunity to kind of have one last say. I've, it's been absolutely fantastic to hear your stories. And I think we could have probably ran this for four hours because I think hearing from all of you is just fantastic um, mm. and hearing your stories. And, and I look forward to kind of keeping in touch going, going forward so that we know, yeah, how you've gone. We have got a number of questions and chats that we'll have a look at and see if, um, if any of them are particular to, to, you know, I think there was one I just saw pop up that was asking you, James, a question. So we'll send those to you and you can shoot them back and we'll put them out there. Um, but any final comments? I might start with you, James. Is there any final comments that you'd like to kind of share with the audience? Um, I would say about um, uh, body language of teachers, teachers, you know, and I've been in classes where, you know, there's the rat bag group, you know, sitting up the front playing video games on their computers and you know i'd be sitting in the back back of the class in my assigned seat just you know you know watching the teacher just get increasingly more frustrated with her with the students and you know and that sort of discouraged me from you know putting my you know asking questions because then you know they're they're holding up the class and teachers getting angry at them because they're not listening. And, you know, and going back to what um, Mo Megan said about, you know, oh, no, no, sorry. I'm about, you know, uh, we're, you know, we're not lazy. I just said yeah. that we're not lazy. We're not deliberately trying to, you know, hold up the class. And, uh, you know, you know, even today, you know, I've had stuff explained in a group right to my face. And, you know, it just goes because, you know, um, uh, yeah. but, you know, even the simple eye roll or, you know, just the way a teacher's standing can, can be picked up by students and, you know, can discourage them from seeking help when they need it. Great. Thanks, James. And Megan? Well, my final say, I think it's um, instead of people talking about dyslexia in a bad way or a bullying sort of way they really need to be like talk about it in an interesting way like we are all very unique students and we gather information differently like I've seen in the comments here like uh, loads of people are saying bigger words are better who finds reading bigger text or texting colors um, finds it a lot easier to read or memorize information or is that just me oh. nah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, um, and also like um, uh, the extra support as well. Again, yeah, not being lazy. We just need a little further uh, push to get to our learning goals. And um, yeah, people need to be. More, there needs to be more of awareness. Obviously, this is Dyslexia Awareness Month, so yep. um, we want to we want to be proud um, that we've all uh, been learning and just making our learning even better for us to help us in the future um and we're all we're all gonna have dyslexia i mean there's no no way of getting rid of it we just need to help channel it like we are all diagnosed with it it's just the way of dealing with it and i'm definitely not letting my dyslexia affect me in my working life or in my studying life because i'm now using all these different techniques to help me with it and so far it has worked. I haven't had many problems like I used to uh, back when I was in high school. Um, but yeah, it's just been really good to also meet people like this um, and talk about it in like a positive way instead of people letting you down be like, oh, you have dyslexia. It's, it means you're dumb. It means, it means your brain doesn't work properly. Like that's, that's so, it's just not normal. It's not human to say that to people and people need to know that there are all these different sort of people in the world and we all learn, act and say things differently. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's brilliant. Okay. Thank you, Megan. Um, Maddie, final words for you. Um, I think it's sort of similar to what James was saying about body language and um, sort of the presence that the lecture has in 
drama student because I'm for me personally I definitely vibe um, lecturers and sort of can read their body language and see if they're interested if I can be asking questions and stuff like that but yeah I just need that reassurance sometimes or clarification and to not get frustrated because it's definitely put this blockade up in front of me and I in a date when I just stop learning and I freak out because they shut you down. Yep. Excellent. Yep. Thank you. And um, Jadir or Paul, who wants to go <laughs> next? I'll go. Yep. I think for a lot of people with dyslexia, not all, but a lot, the hardest part of the journey is getting diagnosed, getting someone to register that something is different in your brain that doesn't mean you can't do the work, but means that you're not doing the work the same way everyone else is. And we need to understand that. And once we understand that and we understand ourselves, we can be the best students possible. And many of us are really very willing to do that once people understand that our brain just works that little bit different, that we're not lazy, we're not not trying hard enough, we're just just that little bit different and we still have just as much to give as a student. Oh, right. So. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to butt in front of Paul if he had any questions, but um, just to add on to what I, me and Maddie were saying about body language, you know, we're not, I don't think we're asking for a whole um, emphasis of teachers to relearn, you know, how to smile and how to walk, walk the walk, talk the talk, but you know, that, you know, everyone has bad days and I bet, and definitely a teaching in the teaching industry you know, there are good and bad days, but, you know, even making it so clear that that if you are having trouble with um, a, a particular set of students not behaving, you know, make it clear to the class, you know, you know, and just say that, you know, uh, well, just, you know, saying that, you know, I'm sorry, I'm not, you know, sorry, I'm not having the best day or, you know, it's just like, or, you know, just... Oh, I guess so. <laughs> no, it's fine. Great. Thanks, James. And Paul, the last word goes to you. <laughs> yeah, um, I just having, we didn't, I didn't really touch on this, but having the accessibility um, liaison staff available and respond quickly to stuff has been great. Like, because of, um, for some reason, copy and pasting was disabled on the exam laptop that I was doing an exam the other week this is my third year so this was a new thing I needed to do the math I needed to copy and paste the math symbols I don't want to do like the weird or search through like the five menus every time but having the staff be able, um, and this has come up a couple of times with like minor adjustments to the accessibility plan and having that staff be available and, and respond quick 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 quickly along with liaisoning between like new new lecturers every time I show up the lecturer pretty much always knows I've only had one lecturer and he was great about it anyway it's really nice yeah so just having that staff available and having that staff be proactive has helped a lot brilliant well thank you everybody we've we've gone over the four minute mark I normally try to keep it um, on time but I wasn't going to cut any of you off that's fantastic to hear from you we will share I'm sure there's been lots of comments I've tried to ignore the chat and the question and get someone else to do that because you can go down a rabbit hole and never come back out but we will definitely share with you the um, I'm sure the positive feedback we get from everybody that's um, been online your stories have been really powerful it's been fantastic. I, I want to take that opportunity to thank you all. Thank you to the captioner and my colleagues, Jane and, and David, for managing the back end. And thank you to everybody who's joining us. I'm sure it's have been of value to you as it has with me hearing from the students. And there's some key points um, that we'll pick out and just put on ad set as well, because I think you've all, you know, given us some, some great ideas on how to, to make the journey um, or the experience within universities and TAFE far more positive for students with learning disabilities. And look, keep celebrating Dyslexic Month. I think it's fantastic. Join us next week for our next webinar, which is on Thursday next week. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your day. And for the panel, if you want to join us for a bit of a debrief, we'll meet you in the other meeting room after this. So thank you all once again. It's fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Thank you.